Cool. All right. Well, let's get started then. Um, <laughs> Libby. Uh, yeah. So I'm. I'm obviously. Yes, that's an ovation. Quality not. Okay. I'm trying to re like. I'm gonna try to multitask this thing. Um, so I'm not Lucy D'Agostino McGowan. For those of you who registered uh, when it was her, um, she had a baby, and everyone's well and happy. So hooray for Lucy. But she is not here for that very good reason. Um, so you're stuck with me. Uh, but I've run this with Lucy and Malcolm for years now, I suppose. The three of us have been working on a book, uh, our uh, causal inference in R, and um, we do this workshop often. Uh, Lucy and Malcolm do it more than I do. So uh, some of the, what I'm going to do here is going to be a little bit of slide karaoke, but I'll try to make it fun. And most importantly, uh, that you get out of this what you came for. So definitely feel free to stop me, shout at me. Um, if you chat, I may not see it right away. So like if something's weird or confusing, um, happy to stop at any time and, and just, just kind of go into more detail. And I might even do the same, right? Like I might go, what was Malcolm or Lucy thinking when they were at the slide? And I might jog forward a couple seconds and then come back to it. So we'll all be patient with each other. Um, but this is going to be good. So I will share first the the workshop website. Actually, no. Let's let's do this. I, I made I even made some slides this morning. Um, so hello, I'm Travis. Um, I live in San Diego uh, and I do clinical trial things. Uh, I used to be an academic for years, um, and then I stopped doing that, and now I'm in pharma, biotech, CRO world. Love it. It's great. Um, we do some registry trials in our day to day, which is where causal inference would come into play. Um, so it's fun. I, I gave I gave everyone a break. Uh, I know there's a scheduled break for the track A, but um, sitting here for three hours feels like something I wouldn't want to do. So I wouldn't assume you would want to do it. So we're going to take a break in an hour and 25 minutes ish. Here's what we'll do. Um, so usually this workshop, we've done it in the two-day format many times, uh, and then we did it in the one-day format a couple times. I think this is the shortest iteration yet, so we're going to see what happens here. Three hours is a tight squeeze for a pretty broad topic, but we're going to do our best. Uh, we're going to do the welcome here. That's what I'm doing. Um, then we're going to set up. So usually we have a posit cloud installation for this, but we didn't have one set up for um, our medicine, which is OK. So what we'll do is we have some setup scripts and things that'll help you on your machine, get the stuff running so you can do the exercises when we get to them. Get about 10 minutes for that, and hopefully it all works. Uh, I'll do a quick intro to causal inference. I'll do a whole game, um, and that'll take a little bit of time. But I'm going to do that to just kind of give you a vision for where it's all going. So um, everything after the whole game is going to the detailed steps of what happens in the whole game, end-to-end -end causal inference analysis, and um, you shouldn't understand like a lot of what goes on in the whole game in great detail. Um, but again, unless you see where you're going um, before you get started, sometimes it's kind of hard to think of like, why, you know, why are we doing these sorts of things? So we'll do that. Um, then, and then we'll, you know, go step by step. There's some cool stuff about standard methods, uh, meaning just like basic regressions. We can even do calls inference with group by and summarize, uh, which is something Lucy and I have worked on for a while. It's Fun making causal inference more accessible and, and less kind of abstract and difficult and kind of buzzy than it needs to be. So those, those are a couple of fun things. And then we'll break. So that's the basic stuff. And then um, we'll, we'll really dive into the, the meat of it. So um, causal diagrams or DAGs, spend a bit of time doing those. Um, the flavor of causal inference we'll do today is um, inverse probability weighting. So what the, has to happen to do that is you have to set up some propensity scores and kind of check them, make sure that they're working. And then you ultimately fit a model in the end, which we'll do in the last step. And I left a little bit of buffer in some of these for questions and things that may arise. So the first thing to do, um, can I, maybe I can put this in the chat as well, so you can just click it, let's see. Um, you'll go to this website and can I even, can someone else drop it in the chat? I can't even see the chat. <laughs> Zoom fail. Um, if someone drops in the chat. So if you go if you go to this website, and I'm gonna stop sharing, and now I can factor in the chat. And I'm gonna go there myself. So when you go to the website, you'll be looking at this. 
Um, this is just the basic, the, the landing page is the, you know, description of what the workshop is, but you don't need to know that because you're already here. Um, if you go to the setup and materials, the second tab, this is what you want. Um, so we're going to install things locally. Um, so obviously ignore the, the bit where it says we'll provide a link to Posit Cloud because um, we're not doing that this time. So instead, uh, we, we've bundled things into kind of a collection of packages here. Well, it's really one package, but it has a lot of dependencies that it's going to install for you just to make sure that you have all the bits that you need. Um, so if you copy and run these two lines here into a R workstation, um, you might want to set up like an R project if if that's if R Studio is your jam. Um, but however you want to do it, um, I'm going to give 10 minutes or so. So right now it's after. We'll go to like 8. 20 or 20 after um but if you have trouble like drop a you know chat or just chat out loud and um let us know if it's not working if you do successfully make it work feel free to introduce yourself in the chat say where you're coming from i thought maybe like your favorite spurious correlation so your favorite correlation that is not a cause um or even your favorite causal association i don't care or just say something fun um so you're not hanging out for seven minutes if this goes really quick for you. Um, but I just want to make sure this all works um, before we get going. Oh, and then the set, there's two steps here. Sorry, there's two steps. So this is the first step, get the packages. Um, the other step, let me jump back to the slides and um, give you this link, is you want to clone the workshop repository because inside of the workshop repository, um, there are uh, some kind of templated Quarto documents that you will use for the exercises to um, to complete. So here's that link. So you want to first uh, <laughs> spur your favorite spur that works too. Um, first, get the website um, and get those packages installed, and then second, clone that repository somewhere where you can use it, and then we will be good to go. So nine minutes and counting, and I'll be here. Everyone else will be here to help you too, if you need anything.
Chat is very quiet. <laughs> oh, here comes people. Uh, good. Party in the chat. Okay. Tim Duncan. Good reference. The, so for Morgan, the error with path. Anybody got a clue on that one? There's a lot of people here. Maybe someone else worked around it. Oh, good call. Thank you, Louie. Oh, cool. Flooding the repo is the way to be. Okay. Nice. Sorry, we don't do it locally often, um, if ever. Seems like there's lots of different paths to installing, and we're going to find out how good or broken some of these paths are once we try to do an exercise, <laughs> which is fine because I built buffer for that too. It's all good. Uh, link to the repo, yes. Uh, it's oh, but you just joined, so you don't have it, of course. Okay. Two minutes. Someone can loudly complain if, if they want more than two minutes. <laughs> oh and it's good if your repo is still unpacking or doing things um i'm mostly just talking for the next like 10 50 actually no because i have a whole game 30 minutes like you have time um so if it's doing something in the background don't stress we don't get to an exercise for another like 45 minutes here so it's all good okay and we're at the time it looks like we're kind of on track though looks like most people are getting there so that's good This comic book design, that's wild. Um, <laughs> love it. Okay, cool. Um, let's do it. Sweet. Okay, so I'm already at the end of this because I was... Okay, introduction. Um, this is a super short introduction um, with some slides. Um, everybody seeing some slides, give me like a no if you're not, um, because I don't. Okay, we're good. Six slides, good. Okay, who we are? I mentioned Lucy and Malcolm. They're both awesome. Um, I'm around sometimes. And uh, yeah, here we are. Uh, so the three practices of analysis in general, 
Um, there, there's been a lot written about this. There, there's some pretty good references on what are the goals of doing analyses in general, and they generally fall, fall into three buckets. Uh, one is to describe, so you're not trying to see what's going to happen in the future. You're not trying to explain um, why something happened. You're just describing it. Like there were uh, ice cream sales were up 20% today or something um 50 percent of people in southern california drink coffee right we're describing something we're not trying to do anything further and that has a lot of value um especially in uh, public health and places like that so we were all kind of glued to our screens in 2020 probably thinking about like what is the rate today of covid in my community um so those are description and those are perfectly valid and useful things to do um on the host side, you might want to predict. So this one's kind of what we do. I think we see a lot of this, honestly. Um, so yeah, my rate of COVID in my community today is this. What do I think it's going to be tomorrow, next month, based on what's happening around me, right? So you might want to bring in some other variables and try to predict these things. Um, what is the what is my ice cream sales going to look like tomorrow, um, based on maybe the weather today and what the forecast is tomorrow, right? Like. Those things are useful for prediction. Um, there, are, there are a couple of call outs to like weather and murder rates and things like that. Um, although they're kind of laughable spurious correlations, um, they can be useful in the context of a prediction model. So if ice cream sales really predicted murder rates extremely well, uh, I and I was a police department and I want to know where to staff um, my officers, maybe I would actually use ice cream sales in my model. And although it's silly, if it's useful and it works, like, let's go, right? So prediction, um, you can feel free to include anything that works, really. So spurious correlations are, are not necessarily a bad thing there. If they work, they work. Um, and lastly, what we're concerned with here in causal inference is explaining. So if I change one thing, um, what is the effect of changing that thing? Um, and that's distinctly different from prediction. Um, so if I change ice cream sales, for example, um, it's not going to affect my murder rate. Um, like, I don't think it would. Um, so that that is where we get the spurious correlations. And the reason we find them funny is because they don't actually explain anything. Um, they might predict them, but the, the links, the causal links um, don't exist. It's usually um, we're seeing an association because of some kind of um, confounding, a, a phrase that we're going to use a lot here um, in, in this course. So um, normal regression, uh, we estimate associations. Um, actually, there are some cases where normal regression can get you a causal association too. Um, but what we really want is counterfactual causal estimates. Um, and these this counterfactual notion, there's a lot written about this as well. It's kind of a philosophical nuance, but it's useful in the context of causal inference because you want to know, for example, what would happen if everyone in the study were exposed um, to like some drug, let's say, like what if everyone took aspirin um, in the U.S. today <laughs> versus what would happen if no one in the U.S. took aspirin today? What would happen tomorrow with regards to maybe cardiovascular health? Um, so what would our, what would the number of heart attacks in the U.S. be tomorrow? If everything stayed the same um, and everyone took like 200 milligrams of aspirin a day versus everything else is the same and, and we leave it all the same and everyone does not take 200 milligrams of aspirin tomorrow. That's that's a counterfactual reality. So counter to fact, like that's not what's actually going to happen. Um, and indeed, in observational studies, we are almost always dealing with uh, wanting to estimate what would happen in a counterfactual world. So we didn't randomize things. We didn't randomize people to take aspirin or not take aspirin, and we didn't assign it. We just saw what happened. And we would like to know, we would like to kind of construct in almost all of these causal inference techniques, the counterfactual worlds in which we actually did assign an intervention um, or not assign an intervention to very similar groups of people. And look at that. That is the last slide. Uh, on that one. So um, that is the very, very brief intro. And I'm going to do a whole game next. So if you remember that link I shared for the calls and reference website with the set of materials, if you ever want to either follow along or in the future, go back to these slides, 
Um, they're all down here at the bottom in the setup and materials. So um, that intro is here and the whole game is now here. Uh, Malcolm put this together, but I've seen him do it enough times that I can probably pretend Malcolm uh, sufficiently for the next little bit. All right, so the general steps in a causal analysis are as follows. Um, you're going to specify a very particular causal question. Um, for example, something that we often refer to as a target trial. So a target trial would be um, if you were to design a randomized control trial or an A-B test, what would you what would you randomly assign? What, what would the intervention be that you assign one group to uh, and what you assign the other group to? So you want to be very, very clear and specific about your intervention that you're assigning to groups in your target trial, your kind of imaginary randomized trial that you're trying to emulate. Um, and you need to be actually careful about your outcome as well. So, you know, you're going to intervene on thing A and you want to see what happens to outcome Y. Like, is it number of deaths? Is it ice cream sales? Is it something else, right? So um, exposure and outcome, that's what, that's what you start with. And then we're going to work through drawing our assumptions. Um, so these causal diagrams are often um, just for short referred to as DAGs. Uh, we, we have to draw those out. Um, and that often doesn't happen in isolation with the analyst. In fact, it shouldn't. So you usually reach out to subject matter experts. So if you're in medicine um, and you're helping in a biostatistical type role, you might reach out to um, MDs or other practitioners to know um, kind of what other confounding causes exist um, in, in the exposure and outcomes that you are looking to find a causal association between. And you got to draw that out in a causal diagram that we'll show and talk about a lot. And there are um, model assumptions. So you need, uh, well, you need to model your assumptions rather, that's an action. Um, so you are going to model what you think the confounding structures, for example, look like through um, parametric models often, um, propensity scores is one way to do this. And we'll look at examples of that. Then you diagnose how well it looks like your assumptions are playing out in your data. So if you're, again, for example, using a propensity score, we'll look at things like balance. Um, so by balance, I mean, in the supposed uh, counterfactual exposure group that you construct, um, do they look the same on all the confounders? Are they balanced on all the confounders um, in the same way that your uh, counterfactual unexposed group look? So you want you want to kind of set up two very, very similar populations, almost like a randomized trial, right? Like where you assume that everyone's kind of balanced more or less on, let's say, age, race, sex, uh, socioeconomic status, things like that, um, in the exposed and unexposed groups, so that we don't have confounding relationships if if those variables are supposed to be confounders. And then you estimate the causal effects. Um, then then you're pretty much there. Um, so you, uh, if you have a propensity score, the last thing you do is fit an inverse probability weighted model. There are of course other causal methods out there that are not IPW. Um, I'm a fan of the G formula and other things that. We sadly won't get to today, but um, there are ways to do this, um, and, and you just estimate in the end. And you should, of course, do a sensitivity analysis. Also, we'll not talk about it today, but it's in the slides. It's in our book um, that I think there'll be a couple links to along the way, um, how, how you do these things. So um, how, how robust is your finding, your proposed causal estimate to things that you didn't think of or assumptions that you needed to make? Um, will, will it break down if, if there's something um, kind of unmeasured or, or otherwise misspecified going on? Right, so the, po the purpose of this whole game that you're looking at right now um, is just kind of focusing on broad ideas. So if some of the stuff I say is like jargon words that you're not familiar with yet, um, or just um, you, it totally doesn't connect 100%, don't stress. Um, it's just uh, kind of showing you the roadmap to, to where we're trying to go. All right, so the causal question we're going to deal with right now is do people who quit smoking gain weight? Um, so you've probably heard such things like actively smoking helps keep weight down because of metabolic changes and things that happen um, when you smoke. Maybe it suppresses appetite. There are other things that happen there. Um, so if you quit, uh, do, you, do you gain weight? Um, we can't really randomize uh, that trial. I mean, it'd be nice if we could just randomize people to 
actually quit smoking. Um, so like take a bunch of smokers and say, you know, you hundred people quit and you hundred people don't quit. Um, but they probably, there'll be a lot of kind of, uh, protocol non-adherence that we have there. Right. So it's very hard to quit smoking. Um, so we would be able to estimate the causal effect of something like randomize people to a smoking cessation program, um, to estimate the effect of the cessation program on quitting smoking or even on weight gain. Um, but, but it won't be really a perfect measurement of actually quitting smoking because I would imagine of the hundred people that you assign to the smoking cessation program, um, they might not quit, right? Like a lot of them might not quit because it's hard. They might pick it up again. So we're probably stuck with observational data for, for this kind of, um, question and by observational, I mean, like not a randomized trial, basically. Um, so we have data like this in this causal data package, which probably got downloaded as part of the workshop materials. Um, but if it didn't, it's in that R causal um, repository that, that we have with uh, GitHub work, I'm sorry, with, with several repositories like this one. Um, this is from the NHANES uh, epidemiologic follow-up study, which a lot of you, since this is our medicine, are probably familiar with. It's a long-term study. I think it started first phase in the 70s, second phase in the 80s. And they measured a lot of different things, um, deaths, smoking, weight, um, blood pressure, things of this nature, over time, well into the 90s. Um, and so it's a pretty uh, robust data set, and it's been used for a lot of examples, uh, like the one you're about to see here. So we'll take the complete data set, and we're going to filter it down to uncensored. So um, censored just means that maybe they left the study early for reasons or just lost a follow-up, so we don't have complete information on them. Um, and so that those subjects are kind of not helpful for our analysis because we may not know what their um, smoking status was over time or what their, uh, importantly, what their weight was over time or the evolution of maybe eventual confounders. Um, and yes, there's an assumption that's happening here. Uh, does this give us some bias, like just removing these sets of people? Um, it's an important one to think about, but now we're going to address right at the moment. So just for simplicity, we are now looking at these 1,566 participants in the NHANES follow-up study. Um, and you can see the variables that you might expect to see here, um, an indicator for whether or not they quit smoking um, in that one uh, measurement year. And then we have something, you know, blood pressure, sex, marital status, income, all these sorts of things. And somewhere in there is also weight gain. And we could look at it just without even doing anything fancy. Um, so here are the distributions of um, quitting of weight by quitting smoking. Uh, those that quit smoking are blue, so yes, and and the ones that did not quit are in the red. And you can see what you might have expected to see here. Um, it looks like there is a distributional shift to the right of about oh, it's two kilograms. It's like something like five pounds, five and a half pounds, I think. Um, if you if you quit smoking you gained over the weight gain you'd experience if you did not quit smoking, um, which makes sense. Uh, as we age, it's common for people to just gain weight um, as part of uh, metabolism, slowing down and other aging processes. So everyone in the cohort looks like they gain weight over time, but maybe the smokers gain more. And um, this is kind of a, a prediction setting right now. Like if you quit smoking, it, we could predict that you would gain weight but did the act, did the, the the intervention of quitting smoking itself cause the gain weight? That's that's the the weight and gain. Um, that's that's the causal question we want to answer. Um, so we can look at the specific. Oh, good, I can I can check my kind of ballparking here. Um, if we group by the the quit smoke indicator and then summarize the mean weight change and give a standard deviation there. Um, we can see that in the group that did not quit smoking, they gained around two kilograms. Uh, and the group that did quit smoking, they gained around four and a half kilograms. So yeah, that's that's what we saw in the in the plot. All right. So that next step that we were going to do in the causal analysis was to draw our assumptions now. So we know what our that first step again was to set up our causal question. What is our intervention and what is our outcome? So our intervention very specifically was uh, quit smoking in, I want to say that survey year might have been 1982. Uh, let's just suppose it is for simplicity. So quit smoking or do not quit smoking in 1982. 
And the outcome is, what is your weight gain um, or weight loss 10 years later? So the causal question is, what is the effect of quitting smoking uh, in 1982 on weight gain in 1992? That's what we're looking at. We've got to draw assumptions here. Um, and so we start with our exposure and our outcome. And the nodes in these causal diagrams um, are just labeled with the actual variables that you've measured in your data. And the arrows indicate that a cause exists. Um, and they're always acyclic, meaning that you can't have circular causes, which makes sense. Um, you can't have kind of the, the future causing the past over and over again. And um, these are time ordered. It's super important to time order these things. Uh, so quit smoking from left to right. Um, this thing happened or did not happen. And then the arrow existing there supposes there is a, a proposed cause between quitting smoking and in the future, uh, a change in weight. So that's the basic setup. But now we need to add all everything that is a common cause of quitting smoking and a change in weight. And again, this is that step that I said you might want to engage with subject matter experts. So in this particular scenario, maybe it's public health um, practitioners or other people who know about those things which would both affect um, smoking status and a change in weight over time. And there are a lot of reasonable things that you see here. So the baseline weight, um, so you know, if someone is over or underweight, um, maybe it would influence their decision to quit smoking. And of course, in the future, it would also influence their, their change in weight. The number of years of smoking, like long-time smokers, probably harder to quit than short-term short smoking also may affect how much weight change is anticipated um, due to other causes. Smoking intensity, same story. Sex, um, do males and females uh, quit smoking differentially? Yes, I think that's true. Um, do they uh, have weight change that's differential over time? Yes. Um, so similar on down the list, race, exercise, education, age, daily activity level. All these things are common causes of quitting smoking and a change in weight, according to subject matter experts. This isn't really derived from any kind of modeling exercise we're doing. This is something that you do um, with your study team uh, in a PowerPoint or on pencil and paper. There are an emerging um, class of applications, software applications that do this well. Um, the one we'll look at here today, because this is an R kind of workshop, is uh, a package called ggdag that actually drew this one. Uh, it's based on ggplot2, so we'll, we'll look at that in a minute. But this is, this is kind of where you start. You draw all these things. And these common causes of exposure and outcome are called confounders. So that phrase that I've used a few times, that is the definition. Common cause of the exposure of interest and the outcome of interest. The reason that we draw these DAGs, the causal diagrams, is that they tell you what you need to control for. Like, so if, you know, whenever you're taking like a stats class um, or biostats or whatever you're taking, you, you know, you, you fit these models and it says, oh, we need to adjust for age and we need to control for sex. So we need to adjust for this and adjust for that. Um, a lot of times the, you know, people come to reasonable conclusions about what should be in a model on the basis of just like having a good sense that these are confounders. But the really precise way to do this is through the DAG. Um, you know, you can really make it clear to yourself and to all your collaborators and eventually to grumpy reviewer too of your manuscript that um, this is this is the causal structure that we presumed and this is why we included certain variables in our model. That is the point of drawing the DAG. So um, what it tells us then um, is that uh, you can see all the confounding effects here. So there were, this is a very simple DAG. Um, there aren't any kind of like time varying weirdness. They're kind of like, and there aren't three layers of time. We all just kind of assumed a time zero and then like a time one where the intervention happens and then, a, and then an ultimate time two, which is where the outcome is measured. So this one's really, really simple. Um, and what happens in this case is that we get nine different confounding pathways because we had nine confounders. So um, the true effect that we want to estimate is the one in green. We want to estimate the causal effect, like what is the strength of this arrow um, between quitting smoking and weight gain or weight loss. And then we have to deal somehow with these other nine. Uh, so like, you know, this confounding path between race and the two variables or the confounding path between smoking intensity and the two variables and so on and so forth. 
Um, so that's what the DAG buys us. So we see then that if we adjust for um, all of these nine variables and some statistical model, then uh, the, the biased pathways kind of go away and we end up with the only relevant estimate uh, kind of being spit out of our model. So the, the grayed out ones, there's an algorithm that does this for us in GGDAG and in other software platforms like it um, that say, oh, if you adjust for the set of variables, um, these nine variables, then these pathways, which were previously dark black, meaning they were active in your in your statistical analysis, they kind of get grayed out, and the only one you're left with is the the causal effect that you were S, that you were interested in, and that's what we want. And it, so, if we, for example, if we took you know um, sex out of out of the set of adjusted variables up here, um, then we would see the black path here, and you would also unfortunately see um, a, a darkened path between sex quitting smoking and change in weight, which would be bad because you're going to end up with kind of this mishmash of um, bias uh, in, in your estimate. So we can look at what's the association. Um, it could be argued that this in its own way, if you've really, really specified the association well, um, that this could maybe be a guesstimate at a causal model. Um, so let's adjust for all nine of these variables in some particular way. Uh, the danger here is sort of that we're making very explicit uh, assumptions about the relationship between, like functional assumptions about the relationship between quitting smoking and these nine variables. So that there's a quadratic term and that the whole thing is linear with regards to conditioning on the exposure. Like there's a lot of assumptions baked in here, but it is a first pass. Like we're at least adjusting for the right set of variables. Um, so this is what we would do in like stats 101 or wherever we learn um, regression for the first time, you'd say, here's my nine confounders, chuck them into a model, and then let's see what the what the outcome actually is. And in this case, it looks like quitting smoking causes um, weight to increase by 3.46 uh, kilograms over that 10-year period. And the standard error is fairly small relative to that estimate. So we get super significant p-value. We get to publish, hooray. Um, this is, this is our estimate from the usual regression. And it is, in fact, what we thought it would be. In fact, I think it's a little bit attenuated, though, um, compared to what we saw in the rough estimate that we did earlier. If you remember earlier, we looked at just what is the average change without adjusting for any of these confounders, and it was like 4.5. Um, so now we got a pretty different answer. It's now 3.5 um, on the basis of uh, controlling for these probably pretty important confounders, which is a good thing. We're going in the right direction. So the next step is to model our assumptions. Um, so going a step beyond what that basic regression is, let's say we're going to go down the path of doing an inverse probability weighted model to estimate our uh, counterfactual outcome. And again, in this case, it's what if everyone in the study quit smoking? So like everyone has two people in, in the study. So all the people that quit smoking have a counterfactual twin where everything else is the same in them, uh, except they did not quit smoking. And vice versa, all the people who did not quit smoking, they have a counterfactual twin that quit smoking in this study. And then we get to follow them all up and see um, what was the effect of changing that one thing in that person's life. If they quit smoking, um, what was their weight in 1992? And if they did not quit smoking, what was their weight in 1992? And since everything else is the same, um, that means that we are actually getting a causal estimate of um, what the effect of quitting smoking is. That's the goal. So what we do this with the propensity score model is that we want to estimate the probability, this is the first step in this, this game, um, the, the probability of the exposure. Um, so the most common way to do this is to just fit a simple logistic regression. There are lots of other ways to do this, um, but this, is, this one's um, a, a pretty solid pass. So we're going to fit, again, the outcome is not in this model. So like there is no weight gain in this model. We're just looking at the probability of being exposed or not exposed um, for every participant in the study. And we're going to base that probability on the uh, confounders that, that happened before the exposure. So here's the same nine confounders um, in this logistic regression fitting the probability of quitting smoking. And once we've done that, we get a model out of that. Um, and we don't need to show the estimates because the estimates um, aren't super, super important for our purposes at the moment. We really want the probabilities. 
because the probabilities now give us these um, so-called inverse probability weights. Um, there are some convenient functions for doing this. Um, so there's the augment. So we're going to take this, this model that we fit a minute ago, this propensity model, and then we're going to put the probability as a new column um, in, in our data set. And then this, this weight, this ATE weight, is um, for, for many purposes just the inverse of that probability. And what the weight corresponds to kind of like mental, a mental model for this for me is usually um, how many times is this person being replicated in the data set? So like I just mentioned about these counterfactual twins of every given person. Um, if you scale that up to the population level, you're going to uh, create a lot of siblings or very few siblings for every single person in the study who either quit smoking or did not quit smoking on the basis of how many of that type of person you need to balance the two populations in your pseudo population. So the pseudo population is the population that has a balanced set of exposed people and unexposed people, and they're balanced on the confounders. So if there are, um, if there is one person in the study who had a high BMI and is a male and had a smoking intensity of 35 pack years or whatever, right? So like, let's think about all those confounders and we, and we look at that one person and their actual exposure is that they quit smoking. To estimate the counterfactual um, outcome for that particular person, we actually need a copy of that person who did not quit smoking. So that's what these weights do. So in this very, very simple case, maybe maybe the weight was 0.5 for that person. And then one divided by 0.5 gives us two. And then, great, we have a twin for that person um, because we need two of them, sort of, like is kind of the way I think about this. We're creating a bigger pseudo population than our original population actually was. And we can diagnose how well this process did. So once we fit these inverse probability weights, we can look at the distribution of the weights um, and we can see all of them here look to be greater than one. So some people are kind of singletons. They don't really have any twins or siblings or whatever you want to call them in the study. But some people have quite a lot. So some people get, um, you know, kind of almost like uh, eight, nine, 10 copies of their data in, into the pseudo population. So we're blowing up the super massive population so we can create a lot of counterfactual outcomes and start to estimate um, the, the actual causal effect. We want to know what the weights are doing to the sample. So these are these clever things, um, half moon plots. We actually have a package that does this in the R causal um, org that Malcolm put together. And so this is the original um, distribution of the exposure um, according to the propensity score, the probability of exposure in the, that we fit with that propensity score model. So um, as you might expect, on the top, we have those who actually quit smoking in the study. And their probability of quitting smoking, on average, the propensity score, is usually a bit higher than those who did not quit smoking. Um, you can see that's a little bit shifted to the right. Um, and there aren't that many of those people either. Like they're, they're kind of few, but again, we want to kind of balance these out a little bit and kind of make two very similar populations, which is what happens after we create the pseudo population, which is now the kind of dimmer, uh, the kind of like alpha shaded pieces where you see very, two very, very similar curves. Now we create a lot of twins and siblings of, of a lot of these people in a very particular way, according to our parametric model that we fit for the propensity score, and then used as an inverse probability weight to create two very similar looking populations in terms of probability of quitting smoking. Maybe a more meaningful way to look at this would be how balanced do the confounders end up being? So here again are our nine confounders. And this SMD is the, um, what is it, the standard mean difference? So it's just a way to look, standardized mean difference. It's just a way to look um, at the kind of just a standardized difference between maybe um, one group and another group um, in terms of the values, the distribution of each of these variables. So in the original data, the observed data, you see that between the smokers, those who, I mean, those who quit smoking and those who did not quit smoking, the weight in 1971, so like kind of their baseline weight, um, was fairly different. It was like more than there's just kind of like a rule of thumb around 0.1, like things greater than that are pretty different. Um, they were different. Um, so yes, we expected that because we knew it was a confounder and that, um, 
uh, these things should be different. And same for smoke years, same for smoke intensity. So smoke intensity, for example, those who had a high intensity of smoking, um, that's their propensity to uh, quit smoking or not quit smoking was very, very different. You can see that here. That's in our observed data. But now in our pseudo population that we created with our inverse probability weights, we hope that these things come out very similar. And in fact, they do. So if we now run after the weights, what are the standardized mean differences in each of these confounders? In our pseudo population, there are very few of them between the smokers and the non-smokers. This is going fast, but this is the fastest run of the causal difference workshop ever. Are you doing okay? <laughs> the, the whole game, the whole game, like it's a lot to chew on um, if you haven't seen this stuff before. So again, do not stress that this is going fast in our getting because we're going to do all these steps in great detail in a little bit. Okay, I got a thumbs up. Awesome. Good. And kind of the last step, I mean, maybe the penultimate step, um, because we do need to do some sensitivity analysis and diagnosis later on. But we can, in fact, now estimate the causal effect. So we take those um, inverse probability weights um, and we just throw them into a model. Um, so now notice this is a, a simple linear model, um, much like we fit before, except before when we fit the linear model, we did um, the outcome, this weight change between 1982 and 1971. Before it was quit smoke plus age plus age squared plus all these things that had to do with the confounders. Um, but now we don't have to do that anymore because we've incorporated those confounders into the weights, this weights argument. When we fit that propensity score, we kind of, the goal was to erase the, the confounding effects of those variables in the pseudo population. So in the pseudo population, which is appropriately weighted, there the, the distribution of age should be more or less the same. And indeed, we just saw that from the love plots before. The distribution of rates should be more or less the same. And we saw that in the love plot before. So if these things are more or less similar, we don't need to adjust for them again in the linear model. Sometimes you might get efficiency from doing that, but you don't have to. And indeed, we're not doing that here. Um, so we can estimate now this final uh, IPW estimate, um, which I'll claim in a second is not quite right because of the standard error. But this point estimate is our estimate now. 3.4 uh, kilograms on average we would expect to gain um, over that 10-year follow-up period with a standard of 0.48. The problem with the standard error is that um, it's it's actually too small because we artificially, for those of you who are statisticians here, um, we artificially inflated our um, our sample population by making this pseudo population. So we duplicated some subjects, in some cases many, many times, which induce a um, dependency between the rows. So usually like when you fit a linear model right, one of those assumptions is that all the observations are independent. We've and very intentionally broken that assumption here. <laughs> so we've got to fix the standard error to make it correct. Um, there are a couple of ways to do this. Um, there are a handful of packages that do this in R, um, robust based survey, GE, there's others. Um, we're going to use this estimator package to do it um, at the moment. So if we estimate robust here um, with this LM robust, then you get a wider um, confidence interval and a bigger standard error which is actually correct now. So remember it was 0. 0.4 something before. Now it's 0. 0.53, which I'll claim is more correct because we've adjusted for that dependence that we ingested uh, in, into, our, into our samples. And yes, uh, the uh, Mitchell, good point. I see in the chat, uh, seen a lot of people use the survey package for IPW8s. Um, yes, same idea there. Like, because the survey package behind the scenes, I'm pretty sure is dealing with um, dependencies uh, and weights as well. Pretty sure, yes. Um, the way I most commonly fix this, so the way we just fixed the sm two small standard error was via robust standard errors. That's like a very theoretical kind of construct. You like do these sandwich estimators and it's math and Greek symbols and stuff. Um, but uh, kind of a more computational way to do it is just do bootstrap. Um, so we can, what, what we have to do here is to, um, create a function that will actually split our data, fit our model, and then kind of just like resample a bunch of times and then kind of estimate on top of that if you're familiar with the bootstrap. So here's that full function. It's obviously a bit more code to write, um, but it can actually, if, if you're familiar with this kind of process, it can accommodate a lot more flexible kinds of modeling, which sometimes are very, very difficult to come up with like handwritten math 
robust standard errors for. Um, so this is without going into great detail, um, what, what the bootstrap sort of looks like. You fit up a function, then you use this R sample package, which will uh, sample, uh, bootstrap resample these things. Um, and you'll get the splits, and then you'll send them through your inverse probability weighting fit model, um, and you will get an estimate like this. Um, so we get the same estimate again. You'll see the point estimate here is like wiggled just a little bit from 3.44 to 3.45. Um, and then we get a lower and upper conference interval, which is very, very similar to the one that we saw with the um, robust standard error. And looking at all three together now, so here um, you can see something interesting. Um, we, we did three kind of passes at estimating the causal effect of quitting smoking on weight change. We did the robust standard error um, with an inverse probability weighted model. We did the bootstrap adjustment with the inverse probability weighted model. Um, and those gave very, very similar answers. Looks like the bootstrap does a little better. Um, I believe that, sure. Um, but for like practical purposes, probably not important. The OLS is that first one we fit, where we said, hey, let's look at the association between these things. Remember I said, this could actually be a cause model if we're willing to live with some super ultra restrictive assumptions about the functional relationship between the exposure and the confounders and the outcome. Um, so if we're willing to live with these probably untenable assumptions, um, the OLS estimate is the tightest estimate, right? Because the confidence interval is the smallest. Um, but I, I don't know how comfortable with that I would be um, because it just, it really is a heroic set of assumptions. Um, but all in the end, it does look like we're getting a pretty fairly consistent estimate, standard errors aside, looks like it's about 3.4 something, like 3.45 uh, appears to be, if we like the set of confounders and the way we set it up, this looks like it's the estimate. You, you gain 3.45 kilograms over 10 years if you quit smoking. And again, that is less than if we just looked at the raw association of these things, which way back in the beginning, remember, was 4.5. Um, so if you just kind of naively looked at it and said, comparing people who quit smoking to those who do not quit smoking, you gain 4.5 kilograms. Um, because of confounding, that was an overestimate. And then there's a quarto file in the workshop that you have, but we'll do that later. Okay, great. Uh, I mentioned there's this, uh, there's the book that the three of us are working on. Um, I, we've been working on it for, gosh, two and a half years now, like a book is a journey. Um, so we've, uh, there have been three babies born, I think like four new jobs, um, like three moves, life happens. So it's, <laughs> it's taking time. Um, but we're, I, I think we're definitely um, past the 60% point uh, and we're really trying to wind it down this year. Um, but it's free online. So if you go to rcausal.org, which I think I have it open up here. So you go to rcausal.org, it looks like this. Um, and as we push updates after we review them, um, they get pushed here. So a lot of the stuff we're talking about is really described in detail um, in the book. Uh, there's a couple other good things. Uh, there's there's some kind of um, R sample description for the bootstrap. That's a really, really handy tool to have uh, along with you, whether you're doing causal inference or any other kinds of stats. I use the bootstrap all the time because it just doesn't require a lot of theoretical thinking. You can just kind of run it. So that's a good reference on that one. Great. Um, so that was the whole game. I will pause for just a second. I'm right on time. I totally ballpark these times, but like, um, how are we doing? Any questions or like, do you want us just to plow through? We're going to do two more sections here and then take a short break. I'm going to get a drink of water so I don't choke. Um, the sections will be easy. So there's the Center methods that succeed. Um, when do they succeed? So like the things you were taught like from forever ago, like do you want to throw all those away? Probably not, because um, sometimes they do in fact work. Um, and then we can do causal inference with group by and summarize, which is kind of just a funny little trick that, that I find fun. Cool, I got a question here. The sharp null hypothesis. Uh, yeah, okay, cool. Um, so how important is the sharp null hypothesis? Um, uh, describing the short null. So the short null would be that um, if the null is true for, on the average, is it true for every single individual? Did I restate that correctly, Mitchell? Like it's been a while since I've looked at that one. Um, and since it's been a while since I've looked at that one, um, to answer your question, how important is it? I'm sure 
um, the theoretical people will hate me for saying this, but like, uh, I'm more in the business of getting stuff done. So like, <laughs> uh, we should probably think about it and consider it, but I, but I wouldn't let it, um, stop your day. A doubly robust. So your second question is if you do a doubly robust model, um, do the covariate coefficients, uh, contain useful info? Um, so I won't dive too, <laughs> too key with probably back me with getting stuff done. Um, the doubly robust model. So the doubly robust refers to, um, uh, for those not aware, the, there was, there were two steps that we made in that inverse probability weighted model that we conducted just a minute ago. And along with that were two sets of assumptions. The first step was that we fit a, um, propensity score. So that probability of exposure. Um, and the second step was that we fit the outcome model, which is um, you fit the exposure, um, you know, you, you per basically predict the outcome on the basis of the exposure weighted by those propensity scores that, that we got um, in, the, in the previous step. So because there are two steps, there are two places where we could go wrong. Um, we could misspecify the propensity score, meaning that the model that we constructed for our probability of exposure is wrong, um, and that could be bad. The second place we could go wrong, of course, is that the functional relationship, we could misspecify the model between the exposure and the outcome after we've adjusted for the inverse probability weight. Um, so like we, in that linear model, assume that after weighting by the um, inverse probability score, that the relationship between quitting smoking and, uh, and the outcome was linear. If that was incorrect and there should be a quadratic or some other weird term in there, I know this is a little bit stretching because it's a binary exposure, but you know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, we, we could specify that outcome model in a variety of different ways and we could get that wrong. A doubly robust method will allow you to be wrong in one of those two assumptions and still get the right answer. Um, so the method I just showed was not doubly robust. If we get either one of those wrong or both of them wrong, we're going to be wrong. Um, but doubly robust Bus methods, um, for example, I, I think a lot of the emerging TMLE things do this by by default. Um, it gives you it gives you the grace to to maybe get your propensity score model wrong, or teach your outcome model wrong, um, and and then you'll be okay. So that's the doubly robust stuff. It's super important um, if you go into this field and and want to do more um, more kind of robust things. Uh, and your question was the covariate coefficients for variables adjusted twice contain useful information. Um, I don't actually, I don't actually know, but if we all understand doubly robust here, I will consider that a success. You can message me offline if, if you have specific questions about that one. And I'll take one last question here. Um, showing binary outcome. Oh, non-collapsibility. Uh, okay. So, uh, uh, Okay, so there's this issue with um, with the odds ratio that it's um, non-collapsible, meaning that um, in some, if if you look at the overall estimate, um, like in a large population, um, maybe the odds ratio is greater than one, um, but then you look in every single subgroup, it could be like less than one. Um, so that's a problem because it's not consistent with itself, seemingly. Um, it's just a mathematical artifact of the odds ratio. It's a problem. Um, but for the purposes of what we're doing today, I'm not going to get into it, but it's a good thing to be aware of, um, non-collapsibility, like in general risk ratios can be safer, um, they're pad, but risk, um, direct risk ratios instead of odds ratios are a bit harder to, to computationally, um, compute. Uh, I've been working on a package with someone called, well, Conrad Stopsack actually leads it. It's a package called risks, um, which does in R let you estimate risk models more efficiently and kind of more robustly than if you just tried to roll it from scratch. Um, oh, there is one last interesting question I'll get to. Uh, if we have three outcomes, um, there wouldn't necessarily be three outcomes. What you could have is a time-dependent confounding structure, which is I'm going to guess what you mean. Um, so like almost like time series. Um, so like you can... Um, if you have like treatment at time one and then treatment at time two, and then maybe death, yes, no, at time three, and then treatment at time four and so on and so forth, a big long time series like that. Um, you can handle that with, uh, the so-called other G methods, like you can do with inverse probability weighting. It's, I'm not as well versed in that, but the G formula is what I'd reach to for those kinds of things. 
Um, and that's not something we'll do in this three hour abbreviated one, but there is some, I've written the chapter on G formula in the, in the book, which if it's not all the way published, it's in the pull request right now, if you have an urgent need for that. Um, but G formula would be my short answer on that one. Okay. Onward. Um, so well, the thing that we're always told is correlation is not causation. Um, we like to challenge that. Sometimes correlation is causation. Um, so you can have all your stats professors send me hate mail. Um, when you have, uh, when, when does this happen? So when you have no confounders and there's a linear relationship between the exposure and the outcome, that correlation is a causal relationship, right? So if you fit the LM um, outcome squiggle exposure, um, and these statements are true, then the thing you just estimated is a causal model, like period, it's causal. Um, so correlation is causation. I, I think um, Lucy helpfully highlighted some key terms here. So like exposure is the thing that we always have to define we through that. Outcome, we always have to define. That's the key parts of our causal question. And then these confounders are the common causes of the exposure and the outcome. This is the kind of triad upon which all um, causal analysis is built. Settings in which this would happen. When is correlation causation a randomized controlled trial or A-B testing? That is like why these things are the gold standard. So if you randomize people to intervention A and then the other half of the people to intervention B, that estimate that you get, I mean, kind of practical assumptions about protocol adherence and all these, like if, if the trial goes as planned um, and people actually follow the rules and do what they're supposed to, and there's no measurement error and all those other things that are baked into actually conducting a well-designed trial, um, then at the end, the estimate you get out of um, the LM outcome squiggle exposure is is in fact causal. And that's, that's why they work. Um, does that mean like, you know, if, if you're if you're only in the randomized trial scene or you're only doing A-B testing uh, in finance or other places, uh, do you need to not pay attention to the methods? Um, and the answer is no. Um, the methods that we, we talk about in this course can, in fact, help you. Um, so it's well known, for example, that adjusting for baseline covariates um, in randomized controlled trials can make an estimate more efficient um, in cases where, like, the outcome is linear, for example. Um, so that's, that's useful. Um, and then beyond that, um, not just adjusting for the baseline covariates, like in a, in a regression model, but if you actually do propensity score weighting instead, um, then you can actually get more efficient um, than, than that. And, and by efficient, I'm meaning the size of your standard error or the width of your confidence intervals. So a more efficient estimate would have a tighter confidence interval around your point estimate. Um, and, and that's usually a good thing. It's actually probably always a good thing. Um, and then another kind of like something to think about is with all these things, uh, everything boils down to the assumptions that you're willing to like live with. Um, and the, the direct adjustment method, uh, as I alluded to in that whole game, like if we just fit a regular old regression model, there are assumptions in there, um, that, that relate to the kind of parametric distributional, like joint distribution of, of the exposure confounder and outcome, they're much more stringent than some things that you can set up by way of the propensity score. Um, so if you know pretty well how to model the probability of exposure, um, then propensity scores can be a safer path in terms of assumptions that might make you go sideways. And we have a fun example now. So we have the simulated data with 100 observations. We randomly assign treatment, um, and there are two baseline covariates, age and weight, right? So these are not confounders because they don't cause the assignment. They don't cause the treatment. Um, they're just covariates in this case. So that DAG would look like this. Um, treatment, um, we're supposing, causes the outcome. And then um, weight is a baseline covariate. So it like covaries with, with the outcome, but it did not cause treatment. Um, treatment was just a coin flip. The only cause you have there is like randomization. Uh, same for age. Age does not cause treatment. That was randomized, um, but it does covary or associate or cause the, the outcome Why? So if we do the unadjusted model, um, what is the uh, 
effect of treatment on Y. I'm pretty sure we simulated this to have an effect of one. So we're looking for a true answer of one here. Um, this one gets it right, more or less. Um, it's pretty close to one. And the confidence interval squarely contains one, minus 0. 0.6 to 2.5. Um, but we're not significant. Our P, you know, like all the journals are now rejecting us because we're 0.2. Um, if, if instead we adjust for these baseline covariates, um, which again, we're not confounders, it's just a model, um, then we can get quite a bit more precise, actually. This is a more efficient estimate, right? So we get the correct answer of one again. Um, but look how tight our confidence interval is now. It's well bounded away from zero, meaning that our p value is small. So we're probably happier. Um, and then we can actually do the propensity score um, method and get even a little bit tighter here. Um, it's not a ton more efficient, but it is a, a, a touch more efficient in terms of, you can see that through the standard error, right? So in the, in the regular old adjusted model, it's 0.204. In the propensity score model, it's 0.202, um, which is cool. Um, efficiency is good, and we're getting the right answer, and it, actually in all cases, but you want to um, kind of move towards the efficiency um, methods when possible. Um, we can bump this up to 10,000 um, instead of, we just had 100. So let's see how, how well this bears out um, in, in a much larger sample. So same thing here, um, we're getting closer to the to the right answer here, like a, a tighter bound around the tight answer with our, with our unadjusted model. Um, we get even better with our adjusted model. Um, and yet again, um, really, really, honing in with the propensity score model. Um, our 95% confidence rule basically just sits like right on top of one now, um, which, is, which is great. Um, what if treatment is now not randomly assigned? So now we're going to have these confounders, which are common causes of uh, treatment and the outcome and the treat effect is homogenous. Um, so the, 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 Diagonal looks like this. So we've added errors between weight and treatment and between age and treatment. So we have confounding paths now. This path from treatment to weight to outcome is a confounder um, and will bias our relationship between treatment and outcome. And so also is the treatment to age to, to outcome. That's that's also a biasing path. So we've got to deal with that in some way. Um, again, the true average treatment effect is one, um, but we're going to see things start to break. So if we don't adjust for anything, if we don't adjust for our confounders, we get like totally the wrong answer now. Um, we get that the effective treatment was 1.8, um, and then we get that a pretty small standard error on this. And um, and we get the confidence interval is like around 1.8, and it's a super small p-value, and we conclude, yeah, it's 1.8. Um, and that's dangerous because it's wrong. We have these confounders that if we properly adjust for them, um, then we get a correct estimate now. Um, now you see treatment kind of comes back in at uh, round one with the confidence interval squarely around one. This is correct, good. And then the same thing for the propensity score. Um, we get a we get a solid estimate of one there. So the right two are correct. The unadjusted is wrong. It's useful to see that as a sanity check. Um, like why do we worry about confounding? This is why. Because if you want to assign a causal interpretation to that effective treatment, you've got to adjust for the confounders. And this is just a, a hint, time brain confounders, um, a bigger a bigger challenge that we'll look at, which is, uh, we will not look at in this one. That's that's for the two day. <laughs> All right, and then we will do this one other and we'll take a quick break. So causal diagrams, do we need to pause? Questions, anything while I pull this one up? Okay, we're we're right on time. Ten minutes to a break. Hope everybody's doing okay. <laughs> All right, directed acyclic graphs, DAGs, um, causal people's favorite thing to draw. Uh, the basic idea uh, again: we specify our causal question, we use domain knowledge, um, we write the variables as nodes, and then we write causal pathways as edges. Like we talked about all that in the whole game. This is this is the thing that we want to do with our subject matter experts. Um, not just as an like the analysts, but like kind of get a group together and make sure that everyone agrees upon this graph. There is no stats and like jargon really needed here. Like people just need to agree. Do I think um, uh, that socioeconomic status in 1982 causes like um, socioeconomic status in 
1983. Sure. Like we draw an error there and everyone agrees and then you proceed. There's this package I mentioned for doing this based on ggplot2, um, ggdag, the Malcolm had originally put together. There's other tools for doing this. Um, there's this daggity, uh, it's kind of like a Java web interface for doing this. Um, uh, ggraph can do it. Daggity has the algorithms, um, in particular that um, deseparation algorithm that tells you which things you need to adjust for. So if you specify an extremely complex DAG, there could be lots of different confounding pathways and lots of different ways that you could adjust um, confounders to get a correct answer. Sometimes you want to know, for example, what is the minimal adjustment set that I need? So you want to not mess with too many confounders. Like, what is the small set of things I can adjust for and still get the right answer? Um, things these kinds of algorithms can can help you there. Um, ggtag can do those too. Um, and uh, it kind of sits on top of ggplot2 and gg, um, ggraph. I don't know how people call this thing. Um, ggraph, sure. That, uh, that that will make it more pretty than what Daddy often spits out. Um, so it puts it together. That's ggtag. All right. So uh, step one is to specify your DAG. Um, and the way this works is the effect, uh, let's see, yeah, the effect of something is on the left and the cause of something is on the right. So we're going to have, a, an, in this case, we're going to have an arrow going from smoking to cancer and from smoking to coffee. And if we run it, it looks like that. Great. Um, so that's exactly what we expected. Um, and it's just that ggdag function, which which makes that happen. If we add in um, common causes of cancer, in this case, so smoking and coffee, um, then we're going to get arrows from smoking to coffee and coffee, oh, sorry, smoking to cancer and coffee to cancer and smoking to coffee. And indeed, that is what we get here. So you can see how you shorthand a lot of causes to a single node quickly by just using that plus, right? So what are all the causes of cancer? And you just start listing them with collaborators, let's say. Okay, it's smoking and coffee and um, diet and exercise and all these things. And then you'll get arrows into cancer from all those things that you specify um, with that functional form. And now we have our first exercise. Um, so this will be our first test of like, did our system setups work? Um, and if they didn't, it's good because we'll take a break after this and we can try to like sort some of those things out. But um, if you go into that repository that you cloned, um, we're looking for over DAGs. So I'll go to the actual workshop itself here. So if you go in that on your machine, wherever you cloned it, if you go into exercises, um, you will have a Quarto, Quarto document here, um, which um, looks like this. And you can see where there are blanks that you need to fill in to actually make the, the DAG happen. Um, so I will give you 10 minutes to try to work through this. So you saw the basic, um, recipes, um, in these slides here, there are some recipes back here, like there and back here. Um, so let's just see if it all works. And if you can start getting DAGs to, um, appear in your little plot viewer. And I know I skipped, um, I just know what, no one yelled at me. Um, I, I did skip. Um, calls them versus group by and summarize uh, somehow because I got too excited, um, but not a super necessary one. And given time constraints, I might skip it for now and return to it later if we have time. Um, but the the DAGs one is more important because group by and summarize, it's a fun trick, but not something you will do every day. So let's skip it for the time being. And the link again, yes, to the, which link do you need? The, the repository? Oh, thank you. Yeah, okay. Great. Yes, yeah, so there's a couple steps here. Um, you're going to specify that smoking causes cancer. And then um, you end up with some extra specifications here. Um, yeah. Oh, thank you, Libby.
anyone have complaints if we started to proceed? I know I said like longer than I just gave you, but I want to make sure we get everything in. Feel free to say in the chat if something's giving you trouble. Okay, I got at least one thumbs up. Cool. Uh, is this what you all just did, more or less? It's another your turn. Um, I'm going to blow through this and assume you got it, mostly. Like, TG Deck's really easy to use. You just set it up, and then it gives you a plot. So it's good. Um, OK, so correlation, not causation. Why not? It's good. We've talked about this. We're going to say it again. Um, we want to know if some variable x causes y, but other paths cause associations um, between x and y. So they're not causal associations, but they're just associations that we need to get rid of. Um, so this ggdag paths can help show you what those so-called backdoor paths are. So a backdoor path is like, I mean, you know, the path that goes through the front door is the one that you want, um, the, the causal effect. from X to Y, but these backdoor ones are ones that kind of like go into X, like, you know, through the backdoor and then like they also associate to Y through this other way and you want to get rid of those. So if you set up your DAG, um, you can do ggdag paths, um, this function, and it will show you uh, all the backdoor paths that exist for a particular exposure. We saw something like this in the whole game um, where I was showing you those nine confounders and, um, and all the backdoor paths. And in fact, I think this is the same This is the same um, setup for, for this one. So it can be useful to look at what all the backdoor paths are and, and um, see how to, how to fix them, or at least what you need to fix. Cool. Um, and let me, let me just jog forward because I don't want to like get to, I'm going to, I'm going to try to given time, find the right. thing to send you away with um, for our little break here. Um, let's not do this one. So DAG paths is fine. Um, GDAG paths, you got it. We can show them all through that way. Um, there, so kinds kinds of paths that we can have. Um, if you hear these kind of jargony terms, um, there's a fork, uh, which is kind of like classic confounding here. Um, so like Q is a common cause of X and Y fork. Um, a chain. Uh, so Q in this case would be like a mediator. Um, so uh, X causes Q, and then through that path of uh, Q, it goes on to cause Y. Um, so that, that's a mediator, where, where Q is a mediating factor. And then a collider, um, sometimes this appears in this thing people call M-bias. Um, so um, they're actually, th this collider actually Q blocks the association between X and Y, which may seem a little bit counterintuitive. Um, So X, like you, you can't travel through two arrows, like t two arrowheads. So X, the association flows into Q, but then it gets blocked. It can't flow back into Y unless you adjust for Q. So if you throw Q into a regression model, um, one of these colliders, then you'll end up with an association between X and Y, which is not causal. Um, it actually opens a backdoor path. Um, there's a whole lot that's been written about that. Uh, it's like one of these like kind of dangers of over adjustment that people like to reference a lot. But over the last few years, like a fairly common consensus is that although it's a cool edge case and a, and a neat theoretical construct to think about, uh, this thing doesn't happen as often in practice as people might be worried about. Um, there's like, I mean, it's, it's like a fun mathy thing to deal with. Um, but the, the, the risk of, kind of over adjusting on a collider versus um, leaving out an unmeasured confounder in a in a in a model um, is like deal with the confounders. <laughs> That's what you got to worry about. Um, and this is particularly true if you make sure to time order your DAGs. Uh, if you're time ordering DAGs, um, you wouldn't be adjusting for things that happen after X anyway. So this over adjusting on the collider um, it would not be an issue. So time ordering can be super, super helpful in terms of avoiding collider bias and, and making sure you're adjusting for the right set of confounders. 
Okay, so we know we need to close the, outdoor, uh, the backdoor paths. Randomization can do it um, because it eliminates all possible um, causal paths to the exposure because you're randomizing it. Nothing can cause it anymore, just the coin flip. Um, and then the other the other way to close it, of course, is to stratify um, adjustment. So like you can stratify, would like break it into groups, like confounder group one, confounder group two, and then look at the association in those two groups and then combine them back together in some smart way. Um, adjustment through like linear regression does the same kind of a thing. Um, it'll just kind of like adjust for those confounders. You can wait. Uh, we saw an example of that. Uh, another use of the propensity score is to match, um, or you can do other things, G formula, um, other other kind of ways to, to make this work. Um, identifying the adjustment sets is another function in the ggdag package. You can say ggdag adjustment set, um, and instead of like you know you just saw that ggdag paths. Um, this one's kind of like that, but it shows you like what you actually need to adjust for to to make the um, estimate work out. Uh, and for example, here's that one. So it gives you all nine of those uh, confounders that you need to adjust for by virtue of this one function. It's pretty handy. Okay, great. So I think this is probably the last thing I'm going to say it is. If you want to on the break, take a break. <laughs> uh, if you do not want to take a break and you're just like really revved up and drank too much coffee, um, you can look at your turn three um, which would be also in that QMD document, but no pressure there. Like you can always return to this later, um, maybe stretch your legs. Um, I'll make sure to mention again, don't adjust for the future, but don't adjust for things that happen after the exposure um, because you're going to end up with M bias or problems. Uh, should I mention any of these things? I don't think anyone teaches the 10% rule as much anymore, but it was a thing. Like, how do we identify confounders? And there is this notion that um, you should pick variables that change the effect estimate of your exposure by 10% or more. Um, I don't I don't even know where the origin story of that was. I actually was taught it at one point somewhere. Um, but uh, use DAGs and let the DAG tell you what to adjust for. Um, Using predictors is a common thing. Uh, forgetting a time order. Um, that's it. Like just time order your DAG, use a DAG, and that's going to get you to where you need to go in terms of adjusting for the right stuff. Um, and we're good. Great. There are, of course, huge vignettes and um, and other resources on this topic, which has been around for decades now. Um, it's a big one. It's fun. It's kind of like you get to draw these like diagrams and think about all the ways things can go wrong and how you fix them, it's cool. Um, so if you want to geek out on it, here's three references you can check out. And then let's take now a, looks like we have a nine minute, but let's go with nine minutes. So we'll come back at 40 after. Um, I'm going to stand up myself. And um, if you got questions in the meantime, you know, drop in the chat and then we return in nine minutes, we can we can just um, address a few questions and then we'll proceed. Sound good?
Uh, someone's talking now. Can you hear me now? Probably. <laughs> we were on a break. Um, good. I, oh, um, oh no, I'm trying to debug this, um, error. Does anyone see it? from the chat. Um, I don't see it right away. I'll return to it later. If, uh, if no one else solves it in the meantime, you could email me and we'll help debug it. All right, we are, we are here. Um, so things that we've skipped so far from the usual workshop, if you're curious, the group by and summarize, we're now going to skip over also causal inference is not just a statistics problem. Um, we wrote a paper on that maybe last year sometime. Uh, basically the point is that you can have Correlational structures that look the same according to many different causal um, kind of underpinnings. So like maybe your relationship's causal, maybe it's not, but you could see the same correlation in um, certain sets of data. And what it all points to is the fact that you need expert input. Um, you need to draw a DAG. You need to know that it's valid um, in order to do causal inference well. So it's kind of the point that uh, it's, it's cool to be at a turning point where machines can't really just do everything for us. Like um, AI is not really good at causal inference yet. Um, it just spits out a lot of junk. Um, so no one's jobs are going away uh, just yet, particularly in causal inference, because we need to reason about these things in a, in a sound way. We'll jump then to introduction for Pansy scores. All right. Uh, so observational studies, we mentioned this earlier that, um, that here, I'm bringing up the chat. I want to be able to see it while I'm talking. Hang on one second. Um, okay. Sorry. So observational studies are where the treatment is not randomized. Um, so in this case, maybe, um, we're seeing 90% of people in this particular population being treated and only 10% of them are not. For reasons that are, you know, maybe baseline characteristics, maybe they're just different, right? Um, so you can see there's an imbalanced number of people who maybe smoke or don't smoke or wear cowboy hats or whatever funny things Lucy put together here. Like they're just fundamentally different. Um, and we need to be able to adjust for those things. And those things we need to be able to adjust for are, again, the confounders. So things that cause both the exposure and the outcome. Uh, for example, smoking. Uh, reaching way back, uh, Rosenbaum and Rubin uh, showed that we could, in fact, condition on a propensity score um, by itself to get unbiased causal estimates of the exposure effect. So that was important because prior to that, it would have just been regression or nothing. There are some critical assumptions here, one of them being that we don't have unmeasured confounders, um, and that's usually hard to guarantee, um, but we can at least do our best. And then some sensitivity analyses in the end uh, can help convince that even if we do have an unmeasured confounder or two or more, um, they would have to be pretty profoundly impactful for, for our conclusion to change. And then there's this kind of like positivity assumption that uh, every subject has a non-zero probability of receiving either exposure. Um, so we just have to have someone fit into every group and they won't be like excluded um, for, for some predefined reasons that kind of breaks some of the stats uh, if, we, if we break that assumption. Uh, 
so again, the propensity score, we saw this earlier. Uh, we're going to just fit a logistic regression in the simplest case that predicts the exposure using the known covariates or confounders. And then uh, once you fit that logistic regression, then you do the, the expit, or whatever you want to call it, um, where you take your beta coefficient and you do this little trick to get you the probability of being exposed for every single participant uh, in your study or every row in your data set, you're going to get um, uh, an exposure probability. And then these are the propensity scores. That's it. The probability of exposure is the propensity score. Don't let the jargon throw you. That's all it is. Uh, so if we're going to do these in practice, we're going to use the tidyverse and broom packages. Um, broom is going to end up helping us add, like append these predictions from the model to the data frame itself. So the way it works is you will set up a generalized linear model uh, with a binomial family that'll be logistic regression. Exposure is your kind of like quote outcome here. So we're predicting exposure on the basis of the whole set of confounders. And then you augment your data uh, with the with the probability. So this type dot predict equals response does that x bit transformation for you. So you're going to end up with a new column in your data that is the probability of exposure with this set of steps. And now we have it, right? So this is what that kind of theoretical population that Lucy set up would look like here: the probability of everyone's exposures according to the propensity score. So the example we're going to work through for the rest of the um, kind of exercises in the workshop is this um, seven dwarfs mind train uh, data set that Lucy helped dig up from this company called Turing Plans. Um, so Turing Plans is a is a pretty cool like service where they tell you what times of the day, or at least they can help you plan your day at the Walt Disney parks. Uh, so if you, if you really want to like hack it and go there and ride the maximum number of rides, you need uh, like a data-driven service like touring plans to, to help guide you through like, oh, don't go to the Seven Dwarfs Mine Train at 10 a.m. because you're going to stay in line for like three hours. Instead, do it at this other time, right? Um, and so that that's the point of, of that data set where it comes from. Um, and then so... Suppose then that we're running Walt Disney as like the park managers and uh, and we can kind of maybe we want to maximize attendee experience in terms of maybe shorter wait times at all the rides or in particular, maybe at the seven dwarfs mine train. Like we're really concerned about that one. We want to know what can we do to, to kind of minimize um, time like wait times at the seven dwarfs mine train. Um, there's this one thing that they do at Disney um, called Extra Magic Hours. So if you stay at a Walt Disney World Resort hotel, um, there, there are these hotels like on the property you can stay at. And if you stay at those, they will let you go to the park at a time when it's closed to everybody else. And they're called Extra Magic Hours. So some days have these magic hours and some days don't. And some seasons have them, some seasons don't. Um, so we may be, as Walt Disney kind of executives, we are interested in how can we maximize our usage of extra magic hours to minimize the wait times of the seven doors mine train. So the intervention or the exposure is extra magic hours, yes, no, in a given day. And the outcome is wait time at the seven doors mine train. Put very specifically, we want to know the relationship between whether there were extra magic hours in the morning um, so you can have magic hours at night, um, but we're, we're going to look at the ones in the morning. And uh, what's what's the effect of having magic hours in the morning on the average wait time for the Seven Doors Mine Train on that same day between 9 and 10 a.m.? So the magic hours would be maybe between 7 and 9, 8 to 9, something like that. Um, and then we're going to measure what what is that wait time between 9 and 10 on that ride. The first step, as always, is that we're going to draw a DAG um, with our with our subject matter experts, let's say. Um, maybe other Disney execs or people that actually operate the rides, they, they kind of know these things. So um, uh, the first confounder we might have is the historic high temperature on a given day. So um, ride times in the morning will fluctuate probably on the basis of how hot people know it's going to be in the afternoon. So like in July, in Florida, you generally don't want to be outside at like one o'clock. <laughs> so maybe you're going to try to jam in all the rides like very early in the morning. 
um, or, or something like this. So, so that will affect both um, whether or not there's an extra magic morning. Maybe they maybe they're more inclined to give magic mornings in, in the summer years or seasons. Um, and it'll also affect average wait time in the morning across the board. The time that the park closes the night before also has an effect um, on both. So some evenings there are very late fireworks shows or other events that happen, in which case maybe people sleep in or they don't show up at the park as early the next day. And that affects whether or not there's an extra magic morning and the wait times. Similar to ticket season. Um, so what is the season? Is it, a, is it a summer season where tickets are really hot and like easy, like expensive or hard to get because everyone's on vacation? Or is it like February when everyone's just gone back to work and they're not ready to spend a bunch of money after the holidays and so on and so forth? So um, all these things, this is, this is our proposed DAG. Um, we have these three confounders, time the park closed, historic high temperature, and the ticket season. And again, notice that this is time ordered. Uh, we time order across the bottom, so it's important so that we make sure we don't adjust for things that happen in the future um, and uh, and that we're doing this. <laughs> Libby went in February and Seven Doors is completely closed. Um, I, I'm sure Lucy, Lu, Lucy's a huge Disney fan. This is how we even ended up on it. She would have commentary on that, but uh, I, I haven't been in a long time, so I, I don't know. I've never been on the Seven Doors ride. Um, apparently you haven't either. <laughs> Um, all right, good. So now, um, using the confounders identified in that DAG you just saw, let's fit a propensity score model for Park Extra Magic Morning. So this is an indicator in that data set for whether there is an Extra Magic Morning, yes, no. Um, fit a propensity score model for that. And again, a propensity score model is just a, a, a logistic regression predicting the probability of an Extra Magic Morning, yes, no. And then if you want a stretch goal, if you finish this in, I'm going to say, like, let's go with five minutes here. Um, if you can do it, make two histograms, one of the propensity scores for days with an extra magic warning, and one for those without. Uh, remember, we saw that in the form of a half moon plot before. Um, so I'll give you a bit of time here. There should be a there should be an RMD document for this um, setup. And let me go ahead and confirm that and navigate to it so you can see it as well. Should be exercise interferency scores. Um, aha. So if you go into exercises 06, intro P scores exercises, you'll see a your turn place. And there's just actually, you even got the template set up for you. And you can see you got to do a few steps here, um, and then you will get a propensity score. And three minutes. I'll be here if there are questions.
assume we're almost there. Any opposition to proceeding? Okay. So something, there's a couple ways um, for future reference or even reference now to get the solutions for this. Um, there is a function in the R causal package um, called install solutions, I want to say. Let's see. Try to search the same solutions. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, causal workshop is a package and inside of the workshop um, there is an install solutions so if you want to see what these things look like this this will um, get you there another way a lot of the stuff that we do as the do-it-yourself stuff in this workshop are actually in the book um, so for example uh, that propensity score that you just fit should look something like this uh, so you're going to do a glm the probability of extra magic morning yes no is a function of these three confounders, ticket season, part close, part temperature high. You could have done other ways, of course. Um, you could have uh, done a, let's see, we could have interaction terms, we could have um, part temperature, like quadratic term, like you can you can really kind of jazz up the, or you could do spline, um, like anything, anything goes in these really. Um, so it's important to think through what you got the functional form of these things look like, but in its most basic, setting it looks like this linear model and then we're going to add that probability of park extra magic morning yes no to the actual seven doors data which is great um and then that stretch goal was to do this half moon plot if you got to it it would have looked something like this um so after we get the propensity score it's that fitted so that goes on the x-axis here it's called that fitted and then we just look at whether there is a park extra magic morning yes or no um these don't look extremely terribly unbalanced, um, but you know, it is what it is. There are it's it's a bit stretched to the left here. I think on the extra magic morning zero, the ones without extra magic morning. Um, good, but we're not using that because remember we looked at one of these before, and there was the kind of alpha shaded ones behind it, which were the weighted versions. We haven't done that step yet, so this is just the the raw data. How does the parentheses score balance? Um, it looks like those without extra magic morning indeed had a bit of a predictive probability that is lower of having an extra magic morning, which makes kind of good sense to me. And we'll try to balance that in a minute. And that was the whole setting up the frequency score. Are there questions in that before we move to the next one, which is going to be uh, using the frequency scores? Yeah, not seeing any. We'll proceed. Um, so there are different ways. You have these propensity scores. There are lots of different ways you can actually use these things. Um, so you can match, uh, which kind of you look at, you want to expose and an unexposed row, like participant or day in this case. Um, you, want, you want to get groups of them that look very, very similar to each other in terms of uh, their propensity score. So it's that notion kind of like goes back to that notion I was saying about having a twin for for every person in your study. If you have a person, if you have a person who's exposed and their confounder function says that they have a 10% probability of being exposed, you want an unexposed person with those confounders converging to tell you that they um also had a 10% probability of being exposed, but they were not exposed. Like you want that twin, you want that twin set up in the matching. So it's a very kind of intuitive way to think about these things. We saw an example of the weighting in the whole game. I will do more of that uh, later, I think. So that inverse probability weighting where you just um, do one divided by the frequency score and you kind of upweight everybody according to what that weight ends up being. You can stratify by the frequency scores, uh, which isn't done super, super often, um, but you can certainly do this, like break it into like deciles or something like that and, and then re kind of... Um, re summarize over those, or you can even directly adjust the propensity score uh, in, a, in a regression model without doing the weighting and all the fancy stuff. Um, I don't think I've ever seen Lucy talk about this slide, um, so I'm not going to attempt it, but it looks... 
<laughs> what? Um, we're I'm I'm I can't I can't slide karaoke this one. Um, we're just gonna proceed. <laughs> uh, good. So here's the matching. Uh, why is it not going forward for me? There we go. Okay, good. So what we want to how we use these propensity scores. Um, has to do with what kind of thing we actually want to estimate. Um, so the average treatment effect, oh goodness, if the words are on the slide, I'm going to mess them up. Um, oh, I hope she has, oh, whew, whew. can you see my relief? Um, so the if the estimate is this ATE, the average treatment effect, um, we want to know um, the, the target population is a full population. So if we expose everyone, versus do not expose everyone um, is, is the goal here. And so you will use your propensity scores in a certain way to get at that ATE S demand. Um, and the kind of question, again, this answers is, should a specific policy be applied to all eligible observations? Um, so do we want extra magic mornings every single day um, to, to, to change the wait time between a, um, a particular window on the next day? A different kind of target estimate, um, and you'd have to use your propensity score a little bit differently in this case, is the average treatment effect among the treated, the ATT. And that one is going to be um, only the, the population that you're assuming this cause for is the one um, who are actually treated, uh, if that makes sense. So should we stop extra magic hours to change the wait time for seven doors. Like, so like among those days where we do in fact have extra magic hours, should we pull it away um, to help with our wait times? Um, other example, these not using the seven doors, um, they're, they're usually um, in, in the medical field, you know, should we stop marketing campaign to those that the receive it or should medical providers stop recommending treatment um, for those who are um, currently receiving it? That's a, that's a pretty common one. So like, should we stop recommending aspirin to those who are being prescribed aspirin uh, for cardiovascular outcomes or something like this? Um, that you'd be looking for an ATT in that case. All right. So to do an ATT, everything you've seen so far in this workshop, including the whole game, we've only done the ATE, like just the effect of exposing everyone or not exposing everyone. Um, if you want to do the ATT, um, we can use this magic package, which is which is a good one. Um, and this is going to create some matches for us. Um, it's a match it object. So here we're just setting up the propensity score here, um, probability of quitting smoking, going back to our um, N. Haynes example. And if we look at that object, um, you can see that we um, did nearest neighbor matching. There, match it's a really handy package because it some of the, the matching it has to do are a little bit complex um, in terms of like algorithmic distance functions and things like that. So um, we estimate the propensity score. Um, we're going to do one-to-one -one nearest uh, neighbor matching. We end up with 806 matched pairs, um, which I think is, so we got rid of some of them, it looks like, because uh, 1566 is not 806 times two. So some of them didn't come up with the match, but we mostly matched everyone, uh, which, which is a good thing. And then we can do things with that matched object. Uh, it said that the target estimate was going to be the ATT. Um, and we can look at the matches here. So the the uh, subclass is what gives you the the class of match. So person eleven got matched to person twelve twenty on the basis of the propensity score. They're in subclass one, um, and you can see that every single match pair, um, as I mentioned, you want kind of a twin of the exposed and an unexposed person. So um, person eleven did in fact quit smoking. Person twelve twenty did not quit smoking. But on the on the basis of all the confounders, person 11 and person 1220 are very, very similar with regards to the propensity to quit smoking. Same for fit the pair 15 and 1082, um, one of whom quit smoking, one of whom did not. So that's how this whole thing plays out in, in the matched uh, match setting. Oh, and I got a question about the stop recommending aspirin to those already taking aspirin. Uh, is not the same as recommending that those currently taking aspirin stop taking it. Uh, oh, I see. Yeah. Um, probably the second one is preferred. There's a slight difference in what I said. But yeah, I mean, you want to... 
uh, recommend that those currently taking it stop taking it. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, this is Chris Ryan. I'd asked the question. <clears throat> um, cool. D does that help? Or yeah, if you want to clarify, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, <clears throat> one would think that if if the if the intervention you're considering is the recommending, not necessarily the taking, <laughs> um, uh -huh. you don't need to recommend aspirin to the people who are already taken it because those patients are already taken it. There's no selling that needs to be done there. So that's what I was trying to clarify. Yeah, it's a good point. Between, I, I don't have to advise this patient to take aspirin anymore because it's already done, taken care of. Um, versus For sure. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a, 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 a positive <clears throat> effort to tell them to stop taking. Those are different things. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um... Yes. And the way we set up the, like in the data itself is, is I think we would parse apart what that actual intervention is. Like, it depends on what you've measured. Did, did you measure the recommendation strategy or did you measure like the actual um, adherence strategy? I think would be how we would come bring them apart, if that makes sense. But yeah, yeah, I was I'll just riffing it. on this language here a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like, um, yeah, it's a good point though. Um, I have to think on that. And there, and there's a really good paper. I think it's at the end of this one. There's a really, really good paper. Um, I forget which group it came out of, but it'll be it'll be towards the end of this slide deck that kind of like really does a deep dive on the difference in these different estimates and language, like a lot of language examples like this that I think would answer your question a bit more than than I'm doing right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you, yeah. Cool. Thanks would for you mind showing that average treatment effect of the treated slide again it had the um yeah sure yeah yeah <clears throat> it had the it may have been the one just before that yeah yeah so nope one before this this one here uh that one yeah so oh with the formula okay yeah yeah go, go ahead yeah with yeah. the formula so estimated y1 minus y0 given that given z given they're already taken the aspirin given correct one um, so I guess this does sort of imply that currently Z equals one, but you're looking at the effect of flipping Z to be equal to zero, like stop taking your aspirin. Correct. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Uh, what is the difference between Z1 and Z0 among those who currently have Z1? <clears throat> yeah, so that, that, which would be the flipping. One be flipping. The one yeah. In, yeah, 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 flipping. So the one and the zero in parentheses, there, there's almost a temporal order to those as well. Too, right? Oh yes, thank you for bringing. Uh, yes, yeah, so there, there are notational oddities here, if you want to call them that. So the parentheses one refers to z equals one. So if it's the outcome y, if z was assigned to be one, minus the outcome y, if z was assigned to be zero, and then conditional on the group those who currently have z equals one. <clears throat> yeah, maybe it gets into almost a metaphysical thing, but... Uh, it is, yes. No, you're absolutely right, because this, this what's, is... This what's is the effect kind of, of, stuff. of changing z from one to zero amongst people where z used to be one, and now you're going to make it zero? Uh, that's right. That's, that's right. A, that's, yeah. a, that's a pretty... That's a pretty subtle thing <laughs> it is and and that's why you need these like kind of like the match pairs i think the matching and i think that's why lucy chose the match it route to demonstrate this is because if we end up with the the people who are pairs then you can start to see this a little bit more easily so going back to the slide where i just was actually um with the pairs right so if we want to do what is the difference between z1 and z0 among the people who are one we're going to estimate what is that effect among like um these people with the the q smoke one um what would it have been if they were zero um it'll be one minus this guy because yeah, this is what, what would it be if it had been zero all along is really what, what what we're asking what would it be if it had been zero all along but the fact is you can't go back in time so they did take aspirin for a while correct uh, yeah that's tricky stuff <laughs> It's 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 no joke. Yeah, yeah, it's mental gymnastics for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure.
Yeah, thanks for the question. Cool. Um, so good. So that's the ATT. You could do the same thing, just the flip now. Um, the ATC is the average treatment effect among those who are not currently taking aspirin. And so we're going to do a flip of that statement we just said, which is, should medical uh, providers extend treatment to those currently not receiving it? So if you're currently not taking aspirin, should they start giving them aspirin? Um, in that group, what is the effect? Um, so same thing, you just give uh, match it like the different uh, estimate, which is the ATC. Um, and then we get a similar, I shouldn't give this three out here, but it's going to look similar. We get 806 matched, and then it's just going to flip the two um, so that you get the, um, in the group that that is the, the um, unexposed. And the average treatment effect among the matched, um, so these are those that are evenly matchable. So you look for all those who are actually um, look the same in, in some regards. So should those at clinical equipoise receive treatment um, is, a, is a pretty good example. If you see um, a couple of patients that look more or less the same, um, like should we be giving them treatment? And you do this usually with a caliper match. So this tells you how far away from the... Um, Within the propensity score, there's like this range, and you're looking for matches. Like, so there's exposed and exposed, and you're looking for matches. Um, the caliper tells you, like, if we if we can't find a match for somebody within this caliper window, like, just throw them out. We're not going to take a match because they're they're not similar enough. And here you see we are indeed finding fewer matches, uh, seven eighty matches in this case, because the caliper um, got rid of those without without appropriate match. All right, um, so if you want, uh, let's take the next six minutes. To, you just created some propensity scores um, in that previous exercise for the um, days to predict the um, probability of an uh, extra magic morning on a given day on the basis of the confounders. You can use that match it package to create a match data set using the ATM method, uh, which we just saw an example of using a caliper of two. And then it can be useful to actually, you can go and inspect that. I think it's useful to like actually inspect the data, like view it and look at what it looks like. Um, so you can kind of start to convince yourself of, of what it's doing behind the scenes. Each of these subclasses, again, is a pair that match with each other. Um, and then there's their probably, or there's their status. Did they quit smoking or not? And you can actually look at that fitted value too from the propensity score to see how similar those were and convince yourself that the caliper and all those things are doing what, what you thought it would do. Um, these match analyses are cool. I'll even use the timer this time. Here we go. Libby's befuddled. I, I, will, I will study um, a better way to explain this while you do this exercise. I'm sorry. <laughs> Oh, and again, you will find this um, exercise in the in the repo, right? Um, uh, should be in the. Should be using. Yep.
So as this time winds down, um, I just dropped in the chat a uh, reference to this paper from Noah Greifer and Liz Stewart. Noah is the author of this matchup package. Um, and this paper from the two of them is so, so good at explaining the differences between the different types of S demands, ATE versus ATT versus ATC, et cetera, and ATM. Um, so like all those questions, uh, the good questions about Wait, what, what do we mean? Like it's in the people who are already taking it and we're going to have them not take it. Um, they very carefully walk through that. And the same, Ken, for that question just saw where you said um, different um, matching ratios. So like, would there ever be a benefit to doing a one to two match and things like that? Um, my gut says that it's going to be whatever uses all of your data. Um, so if you have like twice as many controls as cases, you're probably going to want to go with a one to two match. Um, I think a lot of times the... The package, et cetera, will do it for you. But um, there may be other reasons to use different ratios. I'm not sure. If there was, I'm pretty sure it would appear in that paper. Um, yeah. And yes, Libby, the subclasses are similarity distance based on the permanency score. You got it. Cool. All right. Okay. So that was the matching. Um, more often than not, I'm looking at waiting. Um, so this is the way. Uh, so matching is you find people in certain ways. Um, it's a very intuitively appealing method um, because it just makes sense. You can see like the, the people uh, in your data who are most like the others who got paired with each other. And then you can do um, calculations on top of that. Waiting, on the other hand, is this notion of creating the much larger pseudo population. Um, so like here's one of those examples. We've seen a lot of these half moon plots now where the unexposed maybe are on the bottom and the exposed are on the top. And you can see that their distribution of propensity scores is pretty different. And we maybe want to make them look more similar in a pseudo population on which we can run our analysis. So the different ways you can construct weights um, to get a different estimates. Um, the the ATE, so again, this is the one that applies to everyone, um, is going to be, the, all we're going to see in the next few slides is different ways to use this estimated probability, the little p um, there, to to kind of like upweight the, the weights um, in any given case. So in this one, so like you can see how for the currently um, exposed and unexposed, things will cancel out if for a given i, let's say this person has z equals 1, then that second bit just cancels out, and their weight is going to be 1 divided by the probability that they actually were exposed. Right? Um, on the flip side, if they're not exposed, z is 0, that first bit cancels out, and you end up with 1 divided by the probability that they were not exposed. So that's how you construct it for the entire population. Um, it's basically 1 divided by the probability that they got what they actually got. Yeah. So when you do that, you can see that the populations balance out pretty well. So this is that same plot we saw a minute ago, but now the the kind of shaded background bit is the balanced pseudo population in which the propensity scores are more or less the same in the exposed and the unexposed. If um Instead, we want to do the ATT or the ATC. Again, those are just kind of like mirror images of each other, the effect among the treated or the effect among the untreated. Um, we're going to see that it looks like this. So the ATT um, is going to weight both of the terms by the um, probability of being exposed. Like, so you want to, um, for the treated, C is going to be one, that second bit cancels out. So for among the treated, you're going to have a uh, a weight of one. This is going to be pi divided by pi. For the for the untreated, um, the first bit cancels out, and you're going to end up with the probability of being treated divided by the probability of being untreated. Is how they get weighted, and that will give you the ATT. And then it's just the flip of that for the ATC. So for the treated, it's the probability of not being treated divided by the probability of being treated. And for the 
untreated, it's the probability of not being treated uh, divided by the probability of not being treated, which is one. So the untreated stay the same. You're going to probably end up upweighting a bit some of the uh, treated. And then Ken has a question. Is weighting concepts similar to feature engineering upsampling and machine learning? Uh, it is sort of related, um, just with a different target. Um, so for machine learning, you're usually trying to balance um, like your objective. You know, you want to maybe predict better in the controls. Um, so the goal is prediction. So you might want to upweight the controls, let's say. Um, or maybe you didn't sample enough controls, you need to upweight them. Um, whereas here, the notion of weighting is just trying to balance on a set of confounders rather than balancing the number of cases or controls. Uh, but, but yeah, the, sure, the idea is the same. Um, you're kind of creating a pseudo population that is a some like a cleverly duplicated version of your original. Yeah. Uh, and Libby says so balancing exposures versus balancing responses. Uh, no. Uh, I think I think that uh, upsampling in machine learning is in fact balancing exposures, whereas in uh, inverse probability weighting, the balancing is balancing the distribution of confounders among the exposed and unexposed. So balancing exposures versus balancing confounders. Yeah. Cool. So here's the ATT. Um, it actually looks exactly like what you might expect um, on the basis of our readout of the math a second ago. Um, the treated all get a weight of one. So the shaded part for the treated looks exactly like the original because they all got a weight of one. Whereas um, some of those uh, untreated got upweighted quite a bit to make the distribution more mirror um, the, the distribution of the treated. And the same for the ATC, the untreated got a weight of one, so they stay the same. Whereas the treated now get a upweight um, to to make them mirror the untreated. The ATM um, is this weird min function. Um, so basically, you're trying to look for how to evenly match them, and you kind of have to minimize and like do a little bit of of hand waving here. Um, but I think the um, the Plot might help us with this one a little bit. There is actually some shading here. So like they both get weighted a little bit differently. Um, and you can see where they're trying to more or less match their weights. Like we get a lot of extra weight here on the untreated side where it needed it. And then we get a little bit of a bump over here on the treated side where we needed it to match the untreated. Yep. Okay, cool. Um, so how do we actually do these things in R, um, the important stuff? So um, in this case, we are just going to use this propensity package. We have some functions in here for different kinds of weights so that you don't have to agonize over all that math. Um, here, wt underscore ate comes to the propensity package, and it's just going to get it right to you. So it's going to do that math for you, and you get it. Um, so now you can actually do this. So now we're going to create some ATM weights. Um, from your uh, from your Porto document, I might not go the whole six minutes here because this should be a quick one, um, and then we'll proceed to the next slide set. And just see where we're at on time. We only have two more. Um, we're going to check that we're we're really close now. I mean, I know it feels like we're doing a lot of like background work, and we haven't got a causal estimate yet. Um, so right now, what we're doing is we're figuring out how to use those propensity scores. Like, what are we actually going to do with them to make our exposure groups balance so that we get the estimate that we want? Next, we're going to like do a little bit of diagnostics. This is pretty quick, um, just to make sure that the the propensity scores are doing what we assume they would do. And then finally, that last step, and it's really, really fast. Fitting the outcome model compared to all this stuff is pretty easy. So that, that'll be it, and we'll be probably right at time then.
and while this winds down, um, Libby, you're right. Upweighting and uh, machine learning, it is upweighting the outcomes. Um, I'm remembering that now. It's been a while, but because uh, you end up with like in case control designs, for example, in machine learning, you might end up with very few cases and lots of controls, let's say, and then you upweight the cases. Cases meaning they had the event and controls meaning you didn't. So I think you're right there. Uh, balancing responses is upweighting in machine learning or upsampling, let's say. Uh, but it remains true that we're trying to balance confounders with weighting in um, propensity scores. I'm going to jump to the next slide set because this is the last one here. Um, but feel free to drop questions if there are any. All right. So we can do diagnostics and we should do diagnostics on these propensity scores once we've decided how we want to use them. So the first thing we can do is check balance. Uh, we saw an example of this earlier. These love plots are awesome. Um, they look at the standardized mean difference in each of the confounders on the basis of our um, pseudo population or even in our match pairs. Um, empirical cumulative distribution function plots, ECDFs. Uh, so these just look at uh, kind of the the full distribution of the um, of the weights um, as as needed, and we'll see those in a second. So standardized mean difference, the SMD, um, it is just going to be the mean of um, the the variable in the treatment group. That's right, so the mean of variable in the control group, and you divide by square root of the two standard deviations divided by two. Um, so what this really does is it just puts everything on the same scale. Um, because as you can imagine, each of the confounders, like some of them might be binary, some of them might be like some weird, um, like in the thousands with like these super huge standard errors and things like that. Standard deviations, sorry. Um, and you, and you, just want, you want to see them all on the same scale so that we can say, oh, okay, it looks like these are above or below this kind of rule of thumb 0 0.1 threshold for being different um, is what we want to do with these SMD values. Um, so we can do this with the half moon package. So there's a function called uh, tidy SMD in the half moon package. Um, and so you just give it uh, your data frame, the list of variables that you want to compute SMDs for, um, and you give them weights, perhaps, if you actually have weights, because then it will show you the, the weighted versions as well. And, um, and you give it um, what, is the, what is the exposure variable name for the groups. Uh, so like expose, yes, no, or quit smoke, yes, no, things like that. And there's the weights. Um, and then we can plot them after we get these SMDs. So this returns an object, which you can send into um, ggplot, and uh, you can group it color by method, give it the variable, and then it comes out just like you want it to. So in this particular case, uh, here's a bunch of confounders in the red where the actual data that had not been weighted yet. So you can see that age was like super different, smoke intensity, super different, race, super different. Like these things have pretty large SMDs. Um, before we constructed these ATE weights by way of um, the WATE function in the, um, uh, whatchamacallit package, the, the one with the cool logo, propensity, the propensity package. Um, and uh, yeah, you can see we do a lot better in the blue now. Like these are pretty balanced after we computed those weights, made a pseudo population, and we look at the mean difference, the standardized mean difference in each of these variables, and they're very much similar. And now you can do one of these. Um, so this one will be in the new, uh, in the next um, QMD that you got in the repo. This is the 08 exercises. And then you're going to create a love plot um, right around line 
I hope the exercises are okay. Usually I learn things better when I'm doing them. So hopefully this is working out. Okay. So now we can look at the whole distribution pre and post weighting um, rather than like these single confounder by confounder summary measures, these ECDS. Um, so here's what these look like. Um, on the x-axis, uh, we have the weight. Um, 
in 1971. So this is like, for example, the, the baseline weight, uh, one of the confounders. And then um, this is just the, you know, as you go through, like, let's say you hit 25% of the people had weight less than about 60 kilograms in uh, 1971. Um, and that's pretty similar by quitting smoking, yes, no. Looks like on average, though, those who quit smoking were a bit higher on yes uh, than, than on no, which is actually what we would expect. And I'm going to choose to skip this actual exercise. We can do the weighted ECDF. This does exactly what you'd expect that it does. This kind of like a take home exercise, if you wish. Um, so we saw the raw one back here, unadjusted, no weights. Um, probably some imbalance here. Whereas once we rebalance, now we're looking a lot better. Good. Okay. Weighted tables. There was, uh, I will only mention this briefly because someone already mentioned it and asked about it. Yes, the survey package can help us do this. Um, if you're curious, dig into these extra slides to find out. I'm going to move to the next one so that we can actually get some causal estimates here. All right. We've made it. So the outcome model, um, it ends up being as simple as this, sort of. Uh, there's the broom package where we're going to use just tidy our, our results up, and we're going to do the outcome is a linear function of exposure, period. And we're just going to weight it by the weights that we calculated somewhere else. So remember, we could have had several different versions of weights. We could have had ATE weights, which were those simple ones. We could do ATC, ATT, ATM, like depending on the S demand we're trying to get at. And whatever way we created these propensity score weights, the there they are, the inverse probability weights. Um, and we just put them in the model, and then we get an answer. But what's wrong here, and we and we referred to this earlier in, in the whole game, you saw an example of it, the confidence intervals in the standard error is going to be wrong. Um, because by creating this huge pseudo population, we introduced dependence between our observations uh, that that breaks the assumptions of the LM function. So we can bootstrap. This is usually the most straightforward way to do these things. Um, and here are the general steps of a bootstrap. So first, you're going to create a function. Um, if you haven't made a lot of functions, uh, never a better time to start than today. Um, so what we're going to feed this function is a is a split. So like this is just going to be one sample of our data. So you know, we're just going to say let's take this split. And we're going to call it dot df in the in the first step here. So we have this data frame dot df. And the first thing you do, we're gonna we're gonna run like the whole analysis, right? The first thing we did is we fit the propensity score model, and it looked like that. That should look familiar by now. It's the same one we've been using the whole time. And then we calculate the inverse probability weights. Um, in this case, we're doing the ATE weights. So now we're going to augment that dot df by um, the the fitted response. Um, so we're going to get a probability of quitting smoking for every person in .df as a new column. And then we're going to go ahead and fit the linear model at the end, like we just did um, on that .df. So that's like the whole, this is the whole causal analysis workflow um, done on one particular slice of the data. What the bootstrap is going to do is it's just going to like, through this function, send it a bunch of different versions of the data. It's going to bootstrap, resample it, and send it there a bunch of times. And every time, it's going to return this last line. What it's going to return is this model at the end, um, which is this tidied up model that is the um, outcome, the exposure, weighted by the ATE that we computed for this particular data split. That's the whole bootstrap. Um, so what you do then is you just uh, Library this R sample. R sample is one of the more efficient ways to set up bootstrap samples. Um, so we can um, run this sample, uh, this function called bootstraps. And what that does, it's going to give us a thousand different bootstraps, um, like resamples of the um, NHANES complete uncensored data that we set up in the beginning. And if we look at those, 
um, it looks like this. So that you can see there's 1,001. The reason there's 1,001 is because one of them is the original data set. Um, and then the other 1,000 are just bootstrapped, resampled. Like they just, um, it's usually some proportion um, with replacement of, of the data. So you might do like 60% of the data uh, with replacement every single time. Um, and so all these bootstrap resamples look a little bit different. They're just kind of like jittered versions of, of the same data set. And now all we do is we are going to um, fit this on all those different splits that we created. So you can see we called this thing, going back a second, um, we call this object bootstrapped NHEFS. So this object is the one that has these, um, it's a list, uh, each each row is, is, is a list is a list here um, and uh, it's a list column, sorry. And so now if we go into there and we look at the first split, it's just one, this is the first example of the data um, in that long bootstrapped list, the first of a thousand and one. So we could use our function. Remember we wrote this fit IPW function just a minute ago. And I'm gonna go back and show you that again so we can all be on the same page. This was the fit IPW function. It does the whole causal analysis on the data that you send it. So we're going to send it this first split. We're going to send it the first split and run fit IPW. And look at that. We get what we thought we would get, which is the result of um, the final outcome model. So the effect of quitting smoking on weight gain. And it's about 3.9. Only for the first split. So if we do this now a thousand times, we want to do it over the entire bootstrapped NHEFS data, um, like this whole like list of a thousand one of these. So we can do that with the map function. So we're just going to map so that it does it over all of them. Um, and then each of them is going to get a boot fits variable. So now you can see for every single bootstrap sample in this tibble, the first split has a model here in boot fits. And that model looks like this. It's in fact, it's exactly this. See this two by five tibble on the first split, this object got stored into this particular variable. And then we get the same model, like a different model, but through the same process for the second bootstrap and so on and so forth. So there we go. We have all, we fit the whole causal analysis we did the, you know, we, we got a bootstrap sample, we um, construct weights, and then we do inverse probability weighting to get the outcome model. We, we did all that for every single individual data set. And now we can look at what that estimate was. So what is the point estimate for every single one of those thousand and one estimates? Um, so most of them appear to be just under three and a half. And this is then the way that we can um, get the actual um, confidence intervals based on the T statistics. So we look at the estimate. So what was the average estimate among all those bootstrap fits? It says 3.42. Let's go back here for a sanity check. Yep, 3.42 looks to be right around the middle of this distribution of those estimates. And then if we were imagining that like we're doing, you know, 95% confidence interval here, I would say it's probably going to land somewhere around just two-ish and like 4.78-ish or something like this. And let's see what they are. Two-ish, 4.4. I mean, I was totally eyeballing it. This does a student T statistics on the basis of all those results that we actually got um, so that we can get that bootstrap confidence interval. So that is the whole bootstrap. Um, if you've not seen it before, that was probably like a lot um, because you have to write the function and you have to nest it inside of these resamples. Um, but if you've done it a couple of times, it gets pretty comfortable and it's really, really useful for many, many purposes. So um, it's again, a good tool to have in your toolkit. And this uh, is the last slide in this one and it'll be the last thing you do. And we're gonna be right on time because when eight minutes expires, it will be up at the hour. Um, so try it, uh, create a function called IPW fit um that'll that'll make the propensity score model uh it'll do the weighted outcome model just like you just saw it's going to be a function that runs your whole causal analysis and then you're going to run it through the bootstraps um kind of workflow that we just saw in in 
the last couple slides and you'll get a confidence interval and a point estimate with the int t function. So um, I hope this works out for you and good luck. Now you know how to do at least one flavor of causal analysis. And I'll be here for questions um, for the next eight minutes as we go. Oh yeah, and yeah, the solutions. Um, yeah, I mentioned this earlier, there was the, uh, oh no, we're not, we're not still in the same exercise, both good questions. So for the, with regards to the exercise question, it's going to be, we're in the outcome model exercises 09. Um, and so you can see, so we've kind of set you up at least a little bit here. Um, you're gonna do this, you know, you're gonna need to complete the function, the fit IPW. Um, and you're gonna need to um, set up some results, bootstrap it, and then like look at the plot. So like should get you pretty close here. Um, and then the, for the solutions, yeah. So there is a, back to the workshop itself, there's a function which says, um, oh, I found it earlier. Yeah, install solutions.r. This will do it from the causal workshop package. So you tell it like where on your machine you want to install the solutions. That's one way to do it. Um, another way to do it is I'm pretty sure Malcolm Bear has this in a in an actual, um, in a repo on his GitHub, and I can just copy and paste it here too. This this also has all the solutions, um, which maybe is even simpler. And I'm pasting it right there in that in that comment in the chat. Um, yeah, cool. And you probably have more like seven minutes now, but I trust you. And again, I'm here for the whole seven minutes. Anybody get some up? I hope this worked. I hope this was helpful.